a fairly unique uh, video training series, and uh, that is called SDG5, Training for Parliamentarians and Global Changemakers. Now, our first speaker is Monica Karetz mccall who's Africa Lead for Thunderbird Global School of Management at Arizona State University. And she is here to tell us a little bit about this initiative. So, Monica, thanks for joining us, and over to you. Frida, can I just jump in to say, so I've just been advised by you in Global Compact that we can run a little bit over one o'clock, so um, don't worry if uh, we haven't got just 16 minutes, we can run probably for another five or ten minutes after that, so um, cool. just wanted to let you know. Sorry, please carry on. Great, thanks, Ruth, thanks, that's terrific. Thanks, Monica, oh, thanks. you have the floor. Thanks, Freda, and greetings everybody from Kenya, um, which is a home of Thunderbird School of Global Management, part of Arizona State University, our headquarters for the Africa Hub. And um, Arizona State University is really proud to have been part of the thinking around training um, for parliamentarians. I want to just say I'm speaking here as well on behalf of Amanda Ellis, who couldn't join us because of the different time slots. And so um, she's done a fantastic job with leading this um, particular task of SDG5 and the training around what does it mean for women parliament you know just parliamentarians and the private sector in thinking about sdg5 and so maybe just to comment and say we are at a stage in an interesting part you know for right now we have over 1600 laws that have not been you know that are not are not passed you know um out of 190 um countries out of the 193 un nations so there are a lot of laws that are in existence or somewhere somewhere hiding but really in terms of action on sdg5 they are not being enacted so the question we have, and I think speaking as an African in the continent, is how do we ensure that gender equity is, is translated across everything in the business sector? And I listened to some of the sessions earlier on gender and business, and I listened to amazing women talk about the business sector. But what does it mean for parliamentarians to be, you know, that we actually have gender equality? And so this training program is really allowing for an awareness um, allowing to for us to be able to question and challenge our governments and our policy makers. I think everybody needs to know exactly what laws exist, what rights one has, um, what we can demand. And you know, as you know, in the continent, especially for Africa, uh, demanding for our rights and asking for rights is not something that has been easily done. And so I think part of this training program is really creating an awareness and a network and a forum for everybody to begin to share what's going on and, and how do we make this a better place when we think about gender equality. I'll stop there and come back in. No, there, there's some great uh, comments that you made there, uh, Monica. I think also we've got some great resources, haven't we, that the tool actually incorporates. Things yeah. like the Women Business and Law Report that the World Bank has been doing. Um, it explores some of the discriminatory I'm laws. I'm trying to share it. Equity now. Yeah, absolutely. So we might uh, have, we might go back and, and just uh, uh, unpack a little bit of uh, a little bit of the, the, the context. But look, for now, what I would like to do is just bring into the discussion the private um, sector perspective. And I call now on my dear CBWN colleague, Rose Magas. Um, now, Rose is the CEO of Rova Digital Kenya. And um, this uh, company offers, amongst other services, integrated digital uh, business solutions. And Rover is also a Global Compact member. Now, Rose, we have many businesses like yours on our newly launched CBWN hub. Now, how can the private sector benefit from various initiatives that are around? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Frida. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all, and good night to some people who are in the different time zone. And, 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 and I think for me, the excitement as I was joining this discussion today when we're looking at parliamentarians and the private sector. And I was happy to come in from the private sector simply because when you look at uh, what has been happening, we've had these initiatives, we've had the sustainable development goals uh, that we are really almost running out of the time that we are supposed to implement them because for the longest time, I think it has been left to the governments to implement. And I think mm. thankfully to the, the UNGC right now, that we're now pulling in private sector. And for me, I think it's something that took a, a bit too long because government only has so many finite resources. Even when you look at positions in the government, if you're saying you want to, you know, uh, to achieve gender equality, uh, the gender equality even in government, there's only so many positions. Every government has 
only so many positions that they can give, even if they converted the whole government institution into uh, only having females there, it will not still balance out. So that inclusion of the private sector, because the private sector is infinite. You know, the number of private sector institutions you can have in any jurisdiction is really determined by the number of, you know, people who want to actually start with the one. And so I think this then tells us as private sector that really we, I think private sector carries close to 80, 90 percent of the responsibility to ensure that we meet the SDGs and more so SDG number five. It's really in the private sector that we need to work up and realize that because even when you look at the government budget, it's really that small compared to what the private sector brings onto the table. Mm. So, yep. Yeah, some great comments there, there Rose, and also the, the importance, you know, thank you for just reiterating that this nothing happens without the close collaboration. It's not for governments to do alone. These SDGs, we are going to um, see the world we all want to create. We all have to be a part of it. And it not only includes government and private sector, but civil society as well. And I think that's a great pivot um, into our final panelist for today, um, Naisha uh, Simbang Gaby. Uh, the regional manager for um, Southern Africa uh, Commonwealth uh, Legal Government Forum, Local Government Forum. Now, Naisha, the, um, the Commonwealth Local Government Forum and CBWN have been involved in the development uh, of the Commonwealth SDG 5 toolkit, and we are also advocates of the Commonwealth SDG 5 tracker. Now, what can you tell us about how political leaders at a national and local level um, can benefit from some of these sorts of initiatives? Okay, thank you very much, Frida, and uh, good afternoon from uh, South Africa. Um, yes, so from the Commonwealth Local Government uh, Forum, uh, obviously representing the local government um, level, we, we, we observe under-representation of women uh, in the sector. And just to share some statistics, uh, we only have 20% of councillors uh, worldwide are women and only 5% are mayors. In Africa, 25% of councillors are women. So you see that just representation at the local level is below what is expected, given that, you know, in Africa, for instance, I think women are 60%. But I think what is also important with this statistic is to look at the role of that local level, what it does. And if there is no, uh, you know, if we are not promoting gender equality at that level, what happens? I like the fact that all, you know, already all um, our panelists have highlighted the point that government only cannot, you know, cannot do it alone. We won't be able to achieve the sustainable development goals and even uh, SDG five without the participation of everyone. Because obviously, the the, the reasons why we have underrepresentation of women is because there are so many factors: political, economic, ideological. They are at the at the individual level, institutional level, at the societal level, which calls for everybody to play a part. Now, from the local government point of view, I'm sure we all know that uh, the local level and the local government or local authorities are the closest sphere or tier of government uh, to communities. So they are basically the link between um, communities and government. And they play a role in terms of enabling um, gender equality, enabling women to participate uh, economically, politically, and socially. And more so if you look at processes like local development planning, I'm not sure uh, whether private sector knows that, but in this part of the world, if private sector wants to uh, invest uh, in corporate social responsibility initiatives, they go and pick up a local development plan by a local authority. So gender equality becomes a very important uh, process at the local level because that's where local development plans uh, are, are done. So we can have national development plans, but for things to actually happen, they happen right at the local level. So the local sphere is very important in ensuring that um, uh, uh, gender equality happens. Not only that, uh, the local level, I mean, be it business, local governments, there's a lot of uh, expenditure that happens. So if people don't realize that they are women-owned uh, businesses, enterprises, uh, we will lose out. So there's an opportunity there at the local level and through the local government especially to structure the
the support of women through their budgets and also directing private sector to women enterprises, linking them to in markets, access to finance. There's also this whole issue of service delivery, the services that are critical to the achievement of the SDGs. Most of them, be it sanitation, water, um, electricity, schools, they are delivered at the local level. So this is, it's very important for local governments to be gender responsive and actually to push or to take uh, into account the needs and priorities of women because they play a very significant role, especially through uh, our services. Also, I think it's very important for us to realize the impact of lack of access to services and what that does in terms of excluding women to do other things, productive things like representing our women in politics because they are busy looking for water and uh, uh, things like that. So I think at the local level, we really need to emphasize. And I, and I like the fact that this current, uh, the SDGs, they're really looking at getting everybody behind because the MDGs were not acting like that. So at least we can see that for any chance to localize the SDGs, we need to be working with the local authorities and those local authorities need to be gender responsive. I'll say that for now. And look, thank you so much for that, Nyker. Some really timely input there, especially in regards to making sure that women have a seat at the table. If we want to see, if we want to see real change happening, we need to hear the voices of women. And uh, you know, an excellent point that you were making there as well around um, making sure that we've got women leaders, you know, jurists as policy makers, as young uh, legal scholars, as civil society representatives. I think we, hold, we need women in those key positions of decision making if we are going to be able to move the dial very quickly and um, with, with, with a great deal of meaning and purpose. And I, I think also uh, to your point about us not having the, uh, the, uh, the necessary percentages of women in these positions, it really does lend itself to the fact that, you know, there's interpretive work um, on the constitutional justice. You know, the interpretations are what are the major concern here. And um, if we've got more women there, then it can help just alter that legal landscape in some of these communities and countries where women and men, I guess, experience, you know, grave threats. Um, uh, as it were, in, in different senses uh, in, in, in different forms of discrimination, but some, um, some very, very timely reminders. Um, look, at this stage, I know that Arif said that we've got a little bit more time um, uh, left. I, I can't see any uh, questions coming through, um, but I do want, oh, Arif, yes? Well, I mean, maybe just to pick up a little bit on, on what was being said and maybe, you know, just going back to Monica, what you were saying, I think what's really exciting is this training um, and this support being given to policymakers. And I know that you've developed yeah. this training for parliamentarians. The Commonwealth has also developed a toolkit, um, the first, first world's first toolkit for SDG 5, which we're working with them on the Commonwealth Secretariat, further consultation. There's a tracker, but particularly with your work with parliamentarians. And I just wonder, Monica, to what extent, I know you've been working at a national level, but I wonder whether that could also be developed or adapted for local government, for local councillors as well. Um, um, you oh, know, and maybe yeah. Naisha. Yeah. So Monica, yeah. Okay. Um, I think just to say, maybe if because there's a bit of time, maybe just to highlight the key things in the toolkit. So the toolkit is fantastic, and uh, to your point, Arif, it can it cascades and can be used across, you know, you know, below, you know, MPs to councillors, um, heads of counties, and even in the private sector can be cascaded um, around. And maybe highlight a few things. One, the toolkit talks about laws. And so it really looks at all the different types of laws. I'm gonna try and put them all on the chat. Um, you can review your country's progress on the different laws. You can look at what's going on in discriminatory laws. You can look at the universal periodic review laws and see where you are at as a country. So laws. The second thing the toolkit does is leadership. And you know, my colleagues have already speaking in the panel, talked about leadership. I, I, I always speak about women being in boards and I sit on uh, you know, a number of boards and have sat on a number for long. And I remember when I was a young woman in a board and the challenges and the males the male stereotypes around being a woman in a board it's been 10 years you know of being chairing committees and so that has changed but important that we can think about what is the role of women in leadership and where is your country in leadership so the toolkit begins to give you you know questions to explore around um reviewing your country director leadership how many women are directors in your country what where are they directors in what particular sectors um and you, it begins to advocate for gender sensitivity around all areas of leadership the toolkit also highlights women peace and security 
I think that's an important component to speak about. And you cannot talk about women, uh, peace and security without the idea of women. And so very important in the toolkit. And again, the toolkit also talks about violence against women and girls. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice the toolkit is highlighting five particular areas, laws, leadership, women, peace and security, and violence against women and girls. So the toolkit is excellent. I encourage all of us to look at the toolkit. You can participate in it. Um, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I think there's a link there for you to be able to look at the toolkit under globalfuturesasu.edu that I've put the toolkit. Um, get in and get involved, begin to ask questions. And we are encouraging every country in the world and every woman out there to ask the hard questions to the institutions they are in. And Rose said it very clearly, it's not about government. And Nyasha also said, it, it's not about business. It's every woman, wherever they are, every team they sit in, every sector in society, let's ask the questions. Are we on the table? And if not, why? And we are not asking, we are taking charge. So we take our rightful place. And it's important we are requiring. And I think for me being an African, we're saying no more asking for a place on the table. It's our right to be on the table. It's our right to be on the table. And so the conversation needs to change from, um, oh, I think we don't have enough quotas. No, no, no. Here we are, women. Let women stand up. And so we're also saying, let women stand up. Because mm. there's no point of asking and then the women are not standing up. So let women yes. stand up and say, I am here. Thank you. Yes, and you know, Monica, um, great, uh, you know, great words of courage and inspiration there. It really is the case that, you know, we want a world where men have their rights, nothing more, and women have their rights, nothing less. And that's all that this is really about, levelling and getting an equal and fair um, um, level playing field, I think. Um, so it's really, really good thoughts there, Monica. I, I've just seen in the chat as well, we've got, Arif's been putting in some direct links so people can actually go back and have a look at, um, uh, have a look at the, um, at the series of, um, of, uh, of uh, courses that you've put together. It's a great, um, it's a great tool that I think will be, is, is greatly needed. I'm just wondering now, um, Rose and Naisha, any final remarks that you might like to throw in at this stage before we do a quick wrap up? Sure, I uh, think I will. Okay, I will go first. Great, thank you, Rose. Okay. Yes. I, I was just sitting here and thinking about this, and I, I was actually dreaming that there will be a time when we will not need to have this conversation. <laughs> yes. It won't be an agenda anymore. It will be a non issue. Mm. And, and I hope of the SDGs that we're looking at. I know we've run out of time, but I've just prayed that there's a day that this will be an non issue, will be on the table, and we will not be looking at what gender is on the table. We'll be looking at what issue is being discussed. So that's just my dream, and I hope it becomes one day. Amen. Yes, uh, that's, a, that's a good dream. It's a promised land, isn't it? Take me there, Rose. Take me there. <laughs> and <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> yeah. I Yeah, I just... Obviously, we do spend a lot of time with women, uh, just right at the grassroots level. I obviously think that this is not going to be on the agenda, but I think for us to get there, we still need to do a few things. And uh, in terms of the toolkit, in terms of amplifying the voices, I think we still need to get to network women, speak with strong voices to advocate for the implementation of existing uh, legislation or uh, the enactment of new legislation. I also just want to uh, let you know, and this is obviously from our experience, that there is a very strong link between uh, the economic extending of women and their uh, and and the, and 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 and, uh, and how they are actually able to be representing us in the in the political aspects of of life. So. I think one of the things that I want to encourage all of us to get to the point where we don't talk about this is wherever we are, let's find opportunities to empower women, uh, create opportunities, buy from women, support women, mentor them, do all sorts of things so that we get to that point where this is not going to be an agenda anymore. Thank you. Yes, and great closing yeah. remarks there, So thank you. Um, look, just to leave everybody with a, a few thoughts, um, you know, international human rights dialogues like these are so very, very important, especially when we think about the legacy of Justice Ginsburg and the role that law can really play in empowering women across all corners of, indeed, 
not only the, the Commonwealth, but the world. And one of the distinct advantages of belonging to the Commonwealth family, of course, is that we all share in the same rule of law. Even though um, in 2020, there is still not, there's still not one country that has achieved full gender equality, there's still a lot of work that we all need to do. And we can't wait any longer. We really need to uh, start campaigning for this change that we want to see. So next week, December 10th, is International Human Rights Day. And if there is one action from our session today, let it be that you join the CBWN Hub. I'd like to invite you all to join us at cbwn.com and help keep this important conversation alive by connecting, collaborating, and doing, above all else, commerce. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank the Global Compact for bringing us all together in making global goals, local business Africa. Our panelists, Monica, Rose, and Naisha, and thank you for your insights uh, to each of you, and thank you for being part of today's conversation. I'll hand back to our colleagues at the UN Global Compact, and thank you all again for being part of today's session. Thank you. Thank you.